everybody. Tonight's show features a question that's top of mind for a lot of people who follow competitive bass fishing. The question is, why are we here? What is the, no, no, it's not that. That's kind of cosmic and that would be better suited for our friends on Smallmouth Crush. Uh, they handle the cosmic stuff. Actually, our question tonight though, may not sound that big, but to a lot of people, it's about as impactful to the world of tournament bass fishing as anything that's come up it, since modern tournament bass fishing started. And the question is, should forward-facing sonar be banned? Opinions run really hot on this issue, and I'm confident that tonight's panelists are not only the people you want to hear from on this subject, but that their takes will be spirited and thought-provoking. They'll join us in just a couple of minutes. Before that, though, I want to talk a little bit about the history of banning things from the world of bass fishing, competitive or otherwise. I want you to know that although forward-facing sonar is the current hot-button issue, it is far from the first. In fact, the push to outlaw sport fishing products goes back to before the American Civil War. It was 1850, and no, that was not the year that Rick Clun joined the Elite Series. The man calling for a ban in 1850 was named Henry William Herbert. If you've never heard of him, all you really need to know is that he was the number one outdoor writer in an era when it was a very big deal to be a prominent outdoor writer. Herbert wrote about fishing and hunting, and he was an early advocate of the black bass at a time when the trout was king and most anglers stayed away from the nasty and brutish bass. Herbert hated the spoon lure and believed it would be the destruction of the bass. He called it the deadly and murderous spoon, an instrument so certainly destructive that the use of it is properly discouraged by all true anglers as poaching and unsportsmanlike. And if you think that's bad, you should have heard what he said about the fork. I'm kidding. But Herbert truly believed that bass could not resist the spoon. Of course they could, and they did, and they do. And we still fish with spoons, and nobody talks about banning them anymore. About 100 years later, almost exactly 100 years later, the soft plastic worm was invented and hit the market. It was not an immediate success, believe it or not. It took a while for anglers to figure out the best ways to rig it and fish it, but once they did, the detractors were all over it, trying to get it banned because it was too effective. Bass couldn't resist it, but of course they could, and they did, and they do. And we still fish plastic worms, and nobody talks about banning them anymore. A decade later, late 1950s, Carl Lorantz introduced affordable sonar units that were widely disparaged and challenged. In fact, Lorance's little green box caused an uproar that makes the forward-facing sonar controversy look pretty mild. The underwater eyes of sonar had a lot of people believing that the new technology would destroy fish populations and make angling too easy. It didn't. And we still use sonar. And nobody talks about banning the flasher or early iterations of, of flashers and graphs anymore. In 2011, when the Alabama rig came to prominence, all hell broke loose in the major tournament trails. At the time, I was working for BASS, and I remember getting a call from a Bassmaster Classic champion who told me we had to ban the Alabama rig because it simply was something a bass could not resist. At first, I laughed out loud. I thought he was joking. He wasn't, and of course, he was wrong. Bass can resist the Alabama rig, and they often do. But the truth didn't stop a lot of very prominent bass pros from screaming that the sky was falling. The Alabama rig did get banned by the major tournament circuits, but that was easy. The man who held the patent and the company he licensed it to were insignificant players in the tournament world. The leagues could cave in to the chicken littles with impunity on that one. Banning the Alabama rig had a lot of unintended consequences because top pros weren't using it to win tournaments. The big media outlets didn't write about it. And without that spotlight, sales of the Alabama rigs and the baits used on them never got the boost they needed. Uh, what was and continues to be a weak industry lost an opportunity to make some money. Now, of course, the spotlight is on forward-facing sonar, and it seems somehow different, particularly to me. The images you see on forward-facing sonar today are far more detailed than with the earlier sonar. They're also essentially live. The technology isn't just impacting bass tournaments either. It's influencing crappy tournaments, pan fishing generally. Some people are worried about what forward-facing sonar could do to fish populations. Is this where we should draw that line in the sand? Welcome to Bass After Dark. 
the program that strives to be the most illuminating conversation in bass fishing. My name is Ken Duke, and for the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to work to entertain you and to try to earn a regular spot on your Thursday night calendar. We also want to provide some education, some illumination, make you think about this issue. But before we move on, I want to thank my great friend Ron Stallings, who did the terrific voice work for our intro. Thanks to Ron, Bass After Dark gets off to a smooth and professional start each week. And now it's time for my most important duty of the night, and that's introducing my co-host, the man who is smoother than a $500 glide bait, Brian the Carpenter. Welcome, Thank Brian. you, Ken. <laughs> I love your monologues, man. Just... Well, thank you. You're, you're very kind. I, I, th I thought we needed a little bit of uh, a frame of reference coming into tonight's conversation. I agree. I thought it was fantastic. I it set the stage for the conversation we're about to get into. So it's it's good stuff, Ken. Can't well, get I hope so. I hope I hope people enjoyed it. I hope it gives them a frame of reference. And 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 speaking of frame of reference, can you give everybody a little feel for the way Bass After Dark works? That's right. Like everything else, it was Ken's idea. Uh, by the way, this I just happened to have this sitting right there. Why? It's cool to see that picture pop up. That's, um, that's an inside joke, by the way, that everything is Ken's idea, uh, mostly, the bad, <laughs> mostly the bad ones. Um, yes, uh, every show is predicated upon one question. Uh, we select three panelists, three experts on that and bring them into the show. They don't know who they're coming in to uh, debate against or, or with. And uh, I like it. That's a little mystery to it all, a little, little excitement. Yeah. And. And I'll tell you, we've only done a couple of shows so far. Uh, our, our panelists have come in with their A games. I appreciate that. They they know that they're kind of representing their own perspective, and and I think everybody uh, tries to put their best foot forward on that. And, and I know that's going to happen tonight. Um, I know we want to get into this, Brian, um, but we also have a cool thing that comes after our conversation on tonight's topic. And, and Brian, tell folks about that if you don't mind. That's our top ten list, Ken. Oh, Ken, and Ken also invented that. Um, uh, David Letterman invented that. No, no, that's back when you were <laughs> running with David Letterman, right? Tonight's top 10, the top 10 classes every bass angler should take. There you um, go. There you it's go. It's going to be a fun one. I think so. I, I, we actually it was, had, it was we had 50 that we pair, that we had to choose from. Yeah. From our and, list. And hopefully we pick the best 10. That's, that's the most fun part of it is, is, when when Brian, Nathan, and myself, the three partners on Bass After Dark, get together and try to pick the uh, pick the best ten, uh, shall we get to it? Let's go. Uh, and showing the first guest. So first in the octagon tonight, or or the uh, the Bass After Dark Lounge, he's a thirty seven year tournament veteran, two time bass winner an eight-time classic qualifier nine-time flw cup qualifier but he's perhaps best known for his youtube channel where he shares his uh very outspoken views especially when it comes to this topic tonight we have randy blockett randy you heard the crowd thank you so much for joining us we we really appreciate your your being with us tonight yeah, I've got to compliment you on your outfit, Ken. That is very classy. I, see, I really like the handkerchief. The are, are, are we going to see a, a smoking jacket on Randy Blockett for the next issues I, I of like Intuitive that, Angling? But, yeah, that 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 definitely uh, is a, is a good. That's a positive here. I can't remember <laughs> the last time that I we have seen each other was one of the classics in the ninety, wasn't it? 90s. Oh, it's been a, it's been a while. Yeah, it's I think forever, we bumped into yeah. each other in an airport not too many years ago, and and you were you were running to a plane. But uh, always a pleasure, sir. Really appreciate your time tonight. We know you got a, a fabulous perspective on this. Uh, always well thought out. Always well considered. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about it. But uh, BTC, who's up next? We have uh, a good friend of of uh, of ours. He was uh, six years active in the U.S. Army and aviation. Uh, he's a radio frequency technical engineer, uh, owner of Killer B Marine in San Pedro, California, uh, where they install a lot of forward facing. And he's also an angler, our friend Izzy Morrissey. Izzy! 
Welcome, Izzy. And hey, man, uh, since I haven't said it recently, thank you for your service. Uh -oh, well said. We got, have we got audio issues with Izzy? Ah. Can you hear me? Yes. Don't. There mute. we go. More. Was, <laughs> there's we more go. code, Ken. Get with what, it. What a start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Ken. Uh, that's almost a memory now, all those years of, uh, yeah, all those years of serving. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight and to be uh, adjacent to uh, the esteemed panelist, Randy Blockett. It is uh, an honor to be here, invited by its two most gracious hosts, BTC and Ken, the Commissioner Duke, a.k.a. the Commish. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, Looking forward. <laughs> Izzy's, Izzy's experience with uh, radar, sonar, and high-tech stuff at, at the very highest level, working for for uh, companies that that informed and and supplied the military, I think is a is a great mix to this panel. But BTC, we got one more guest. Yeah, that and the brown nosing clearly has uh, helped him get on this panel. He just oh. witnessed. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the compliments, Izzy. No, no, I I say. <laughs> <laughs> and our and our last uh, panelist tonight in his uh, first year fishing the Bassmaster Opens, he won an event. Uh, qualified for the Classic and qualified for the 2024 Elite Series. Also a uh, fellow with a very popular YouTube channel. Um, what I think is one of the most hardest working guys out there. I think he's got half a million subs and 1,200 videos uploaded. They call him the, uh, the uh, anti-Jacob Fouts or the answer to, the industry's answer. Uh, we have Ben Milliken. How are we doing tonight, gentlemen? Ben, we're, doing, ben, we're good. doing good. We can't, we see, can't you, see you though. Oh, that's not oh. ideal. That is, that that is, is, less, that than is ideal. less than ideal. And I've got a, I've wicked, got a echo. wicked echo. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Good start. There you go. There you go. Ben, 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 so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Joining us tonight. We, appreciate we appreciate it. it. <laughs> thank you guys for having me on. Been a fan of uh, Mr. Duke for a long time. That's Izzy, that's thank you kind. for your service. My pleasure. Brian. We've known each other for a handful of years, fished together back before this forward-facing sonar thing, the last time we fished. It was, it was just, coming, just out. coming out. Yeah. 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 Hey, Nate, hey, we, Nate got we got a, a terrible, terrible echo, echo when, when Ben, came, ben on. came on. With me? Yeah, has yeah, anybody, anybody else got, else got it? it? Me, me, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Maybe Nathan, Maybe Nathan can, can clear, clear that, that up. up. Um, um, hopefully he hopefully can. can. Perfect. Let me. Okay, okay. Ben, I don't, I don't, okay. Okay. for a moment, for a moment we, we could hear, I think we got you back, back now. All right. But we still have, still that, have echo. that echo. Um, yes. Still an echo. Nathan, 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 let me start, let me start the, conversation the conversation with Randy. Um, Randy, you've been very outspoken in your opposition to forward facing sonar. Uh, just for, for clarity's sake, I'm, I'm very curious about maybe you could state your position for us. Uh, are you opposed to forward-facing sonar? I, I believe you are. Are you opposed to it just in the just in the tournament world, or or generally? Do you think it represents a big enough threat to the sport that that we need to consider the potential of of limiting or banning it? Well, it's. I think one of the things that one of the primary focuses of this conversation is you can't just discuss forward-facing sonar in the state that exists right now. It's almost like you have to discuss it on what the future developments are going to be because. You know, it's in its infancy right now. So the things that I'm, I'm obviously concerned about it right now, but I'm more concerned about what it's going to look like 10 years from now, as far as if this technology continues with, you know, no rains, you know, just, you know, free for all, you know, what is what what are we going to morph into in another 10, 20 years out there? So that's 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 one part of it. But there's, you know, another 20 things that we've talked about over and over on a lot of the videos I've done. That's a great point. You know, the future of it, and that's actually, Randy, one of the reasons why we, we brought Izzy on the show, because Izzy is, is very much a tech expert. He's an electrical engineer, a, a radio frequency engineer. He's a guy who's worked at the highest levels of, of radar and sonar, supplying the military and so forth. And we want to get into Izzy and his, his views of where, where forward facing is going and, and not just forward facing, but maybe whatever's beyond that. Uh, do we have Ben back yet? Ben, I'm, ben, hoping, I'm hoping we've, we've lost, lost that, that echo. echo. Oh, oh, maybe, maybe not. not. Well, I'll tell you I'll what, Ben. You, we want to hear what you have to say, so, so echo, echo or no, let's, uh, let's power through. Uh, Randy was just telling us that uh, one of the concerns he has, 
And one of the reasons for his opposition to forward facing sonar is not just where it is now, but where, where it will be in five years, 10 years down the road. Let, let's get your position. I'd kind of like everybody to sort of inform us, us as to where, where you are now. now. What is, what your, is attitude your attitude toward the technology? technology? Uh, uh, are, are we a place, place where we can we draw a line, line to say, or, is or is that, that way, in, way the in the future? Yeah, you know, there's only so many different um, ways that sonar can point um, with, with, with the sonar that we have now. Now, I'm sure Izzy's going to come up different ways, uh, different sonar waves, um, whether that be some type of infrared radiation or, or something. But truly, when we look at forward-facing sonar, we're using the exact same technology, basically, as we were way back when we were using flashers. Really, flashers were the, the first uh, live sonar that was available to us. Everything since then with 2D sonar, side scan, down scan, um, has all been, you know, in the past, as you read it on the graph, left to right or top to bottom. And so forward facing sonar simply takes the same exact sonar technology that we had with, with a flasher, the earliest graphs that we had, and just puts on a little bit more, you know, efficient to read horizontal screen that is nearly live. Um, so, so my opinion on it really personally is, we, we can have this idea that the sky is falling with, with, with catch rates and creel rates. And I've got some statistical data on this. Um, I'm not just going to simply go off and, and try to act like uh, I just read through my, my comments on, on, on my actual analytics. And a lot of people don't know my background, but I actually have a degree in environmental studies. Um, I spent a lot of time in studying the scientific method. Um, and so I, I actually come at this idea from a really centered point on this um, before I make any type of claims, it's based on data, uh, not just opinions. But um, where I'm going with that is that there isn't many more things we can do to make this technology better. Uh, I mean, even, even if we had some type of means that said what species each fish was on the screen, that doesn't really help. If we could lock onto a fish and follow it around, that doesn't help. I can do that with my foot now anyways, with the troll motor pedal. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's somewhere it can go. Obviously it's going to get more detailed. Screens are going to get bigger, um, be a little bit better target separation, but there's really not that many places that I feel it can go that, that really is going to keep it progressing. Ben makes, ben makes a great, a great point, point there. there. And, and, and is he, uh, uh one of the, one of the things, things that Ben mentioned, mentioned is one of the, one of the things, things that's been top of mind for me since the forward facing controversy came up. And that is exactly what he said about flashers back in the, in the fifties, when Lawrence introduced the little green box, the little red box, that was, that was a live instant, almost instantaneous readout of sonar. Of course it was pointed straight down in a cone and uh, all that's really, well, in my eyes anyway, as a, a very unsophisticated electronics user, all that's really changed is the way we point that transducer. Um, is that a fair assessment or, or is there a lot more to it than I realize? Um, so, so Ben actually did paraphrase it really well. I mean, essentially from a hardware standpoint, um, uh, or I should say from a algorithmic standpoint, um, it's not doing forward facing sort is not doing something that is like off the wall or completely, you know, completely different from what we had seen traditional sonar doing. What has changed um, is the hardware. What has changed is um, is essentially the sophistication of the hardware utilized, and that and that essentially has enabled the sonar <clears throat> to achieve uh, uh, data rates uh, high enough to essentially create um, an image on your unit that that uh, that displays as a stream. So, in a traditional sonar unit, um, at a high level, you you have you have the same sequences occurring, except in a forward facing sonar. Um, you have this element, you have the same uh, transducer, this, this, uh, this um, device that is essentially interacting with the environment. The environment's all analog, right? I mean, we live in an analog world. It takes this analog data in, right? And, and, and it transmits it electronically to a medium, which in many cases is, is the box, right? If you ever wondered what that box was, like, why do I have this box that is between my transducer and my unit? That's what, that, that's, what that's doing. It's taking that analog data in. It's translating it essentially to a standard 
uh, you, you probably notice it's Ethernet, right? That's a standard dictated by some IEEE, you know, dictated by the, or not dictated rather, but based on the gigabaud rate or the, the, the physical layer. It takes that in and it essentially takes this massive data stream into the unit and then the, a receiver uh, then uh, shoves that into dynamic memory. The processor can recall that and all it does is print it to your screen. It's just doing that in a much more sophisticated manner, right? Like you're not you're not sweeping a, a region and then and then and then stepping through and seeing data just come 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 up on your screen the same way. Like 360 technology is the same way. It's essentially a transducer just sweeping in a Doppler type fashion. I don't want to go on too much about this. I, <laughs> I don't I don't want to I don't want to drive too many people out of, uh, <laughs> out of the, out of the uh, broadcast, but but. Um, but that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly right. So I think what we're going to see in the future is um, we're going to transcend that because we're going to start pushing the boundaries of the, res of the resolution so far. Our hardware and our modeling and our simulation is going to get so good. And the resolution is going to get so good. And I think we're going to see um, I think we're going to see an integration of AI into these into these algorithms. We're going to see that because the device doesn't think now it doesn't interpret. It doesn't make decisions. All it does is take data in and prints it we're going to get to a point and I don't think actually we're that far off. If you're upset about what it does now, boy, <laughs> I think you're going to be pretty fired up because it, I think we're going to come into an era and I'm as concerned about it, I guess, as anybody, but because we're, I think we're going to get into an era where it's going to start making decisions. I mean, it's going to be uh, interconnected. There's going to be data sharing. It's going to take all this data and I've probably already talked enough, but it's going to take a lot of data. And I think these units are, going to essentially share this data and and you will have not just the data you've you've um accrued and on your unit but you'll have data that the unit also i mean it's doing that now google google knows traffic it knows traffic and drive times based off what everybody else is doing it's nothing new there's cars that drive them that drive themselves i mean half of us probably got them i don't but <laughs> but um, so this isn't novel. And I, I don't think it'd be out of left field if you went to an ICAST in three or four years and, and said, hey, come take a look at this. <laughs> you know, one of the manufacturers, right? BTC, yeah, you're a guy who tries to stay on top of a lot of the tech stuff. Uh, a little, little, little this, little that. I don't know. Um, I Throw to me to bad time. Ken, I was texting okay. Ben over our technical issues. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, Ben, we're we're fighting on that that <laughs> echo thing. So uh, we we have muted you just because of what it's doing with the echo. If you want to jump in, if you can wave your hand, we'll get you right then. We don't. We're not trying to silence you at all. We just want to uh, try to avoid that echo. Randy, what you heard from Izzy there, and what you heard from Ben as well. That some of that stuff frightens me, you know, the AI elements of it and so forth. And I've talked with a number of people who tell me that exactly what Izzy has said, that this thing is going to start thinking on its own on some level. It's going to communicate with other units. It's going to be able to inform other anglers about a school of fish, maybe that that angler A has located. Uh, it's going to be advancing in ways. And to Ben's point earlier, Ben nailed one thing when he said it's going to be able to track a fish. It's going to be able to keep him 45 feet, you know, downwind of a fish at some point is, is I'm, I'm assuming that this is the kind of thing that you're very concerned about, Randy. Well, yeah, I, I don't think that if anybody does not have a problem with AI entering the bass fishing arena, I just can't, I can't wrap my mind around how somebody would be okay with progressing to that level. Another thing with that is if you look at, just look at what we're doing right now, we're on this computer, we're on this podcast. If you had asked somebody 40 or 50 years ago if this technology would have been available, there's no way they could cell phones or anything like that. So I don't think we have any idea about the potential R&D with this. Now, this is one aspect of it. You know, when you're talking about the technology, that is only one small part of this entire debate. And I realize a lot of people can't really wrap their head around sort of the aesthetic sort of part of it that goes beyond that. When I talk about the, you know, what it takes away from the sport intrinsically. Um, you get into the whole financial aspect of it. And, you know, I don't think we can have a debate on this, just focusing on where that technology is headed. I mean, if, if it's not that big of a deal, why has there been a complete domination the last two years? If there's not that, if it's not that much difference in 2D sonar, then, then why has it just become everybody's crutch that's having success on the circuit out there? 
Ben, that sounds like a segue to you uh, because you mentioned you had some data. And, and after you, if maybe this is not the best time for you to introduce that data, but I've got some data if if you're not, if, if this is not the opportune time for you to jump in with yours. No, let's go for it, man. Um, I couldn't couldn't disagree more. Um, so something that gets thrown around a lot is this idea that um, someone is a scoper. Someone's a live scoper. scoper. And that's something that gets thrown around from people that don't actually understand why people are winning tournaments and how they're catching fish. Because I think people like Randy, if you watch some of his videos, and luckily I don't spend a lot of time on that stuff, um, they – they, they get the idea that you put the trolling motor in the water, whether that be working hard in practice all day, you know, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day or not. You just put the trolling motor in the water and you're bound to just go out in the middle of the lake and catch a big enough bag to win the tournament or to get a high place in the tournament. Where in reality, um, myself and the other anglers that have had success – you know, that, that Mr. Mr. Randy called out in his recent video about how, you know, he says none of the, the young anglers, none of the anglers in the top 10 would have qualified, including myself, without being scopers, without using forward facing sonar. When in reality, we're using every possible advantage that there is and in, in drawing from all of our knowledge. When, when you go out on the lake, it doesn't matter what type of technology that you're using. Um, you got to use everything to your advantage. And as far as I'm concerned, like the technology was available at the same time for everyone. You know, we look at someone like Jacob Tompkins or Trey McKinney, young, 21, 18 years old, that are dominating and doing extremely well. You, you think it's because they're good with a cell phone? You think it's good? They're, they're good at that because they play video games? Like Jake... JT Tompkins fishes like 340 days a year. He literally drives all across the country fishing every single day. And the same goes for Trey. And that's just a, a really slighted view at what's actually happening on the water when, when you're just going to say that people qualify because they're scopers. So if you want to throw some numbers out, here's some numbers. So what live scope came out, you know, we say it came out what 2018, but really it was 2019. 2020 before it even became something that people really started effectively using. Can we agree on that, Randy? Yeah, it's been about that time. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just go back and pull some data from, you know, catch rates. We're, we're talking about people catching more fish than ever. We're talking about people having higher, you know, they're catching bigger bass than ever. Well, if you're going to go back and look at that, I, I mean, it's as simple as, as some points that Ken has brought up in the past about looking at elite series data, catch rates, average catch rates over the last, you know, since 2006 when the elite series was formed. Um, 2018 was the highest catch rate ever, about 4.7 bass per day per angler. And of course, there is so many more, in, there's so many more impacts on that number that are outside of technology, you know, like talent in the sport. We had a giant shift of talent go from the elite series over when they split to MLF. The venue you're on. If you go to the Sabine River, you're going to have less fish caught and less weight caught than if you go to the St. Lawrence River and everyone's catching 24 pounds of smallmouth. Weather, of course, and, and then technology, obviously, is, is a factor there, too. But the worst catch rate since the Elite Series came out was in 2020 and 2021. So that was several years down the road. We got opens guys getting in, everything. But 2021 and 2020 were the lowest ever. So then you beat me to my own data. How dare you, sir? How dare I'm not gonna you? I'm going to something like this without an open point of view. And I think something that a lot of people, you know, Randy recently took the time to make a video specifically about me. Um, a lot of people that don't realize about me is I was, I, I just jumped into the opens level of competition this year, this last year. I won three state championships. Most of the local tournaments I entered before live scope was ever invented. And I'm not going to say I would have jumped into the elite series and qualified then if I would have done it then. But people like myself, people like John Garrett, John Garrett qualified for the Bassmaster Classic through the college bracket. Do you know what year that was in, Randy? No. 2016. So I, I'm going to go ahead and say he probably 
would have done pretty well in the Opens back then. And he has done well in the Opens through the time. And he didn't qualify for the Elite Series because he could only use forward-facing sonar. And what about JT Tompkins? Brian, here's one for you. JT Tompkins qualified for the Bassmaster Classic, and he did it on the Chesapeake Bay by winning an Open. In the Chesapeake Bay, he was banging a chatterbait on the riprap on the bank in the worst conditions possible. Brian, can you scope fish very well in two feet of water with a chatterbait in the Chesapeake Bay? He was. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was in the Northeast on some offshore structure. 2019? And... Oh, I'm sorry. He Did he win there last year? Two years ago. 2021, sorry. Yeah. I. That was I don't know, Ben. I, I wasn't in his boat. I had heard that he was. I'm just saying, you turn on the offshore. side, you see him throwing against the bank with the chatterbait. And these are yeah. phenomenal yeah. anglers. To go ahead and say that the youth in the sport is dominating because of technology specifically is very, very <laughs> short sighted until you actually look at some data. Yeah. And, you know, talking about the data, Ben, um, yeah. I, I talked about some data when I was on uh, an episode of Bass Talk Live not that long ago, and yeah, you you know the numbers. You're 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 dead on. What I didn't have at that time was the complete 2023 numbers. And in 2023, uh, and, and of course we're going with the Elite Series. Um, and admittedly, that's very anecdotal. Ben pointed it out. A lot has to do with where you're fishing, the weather, the timing, and all all those things. So so this data set is is limited and and not as great as we'd like it to be but 2023 had the highest catch rates ever but that was kind of a potentially an outlier because the preceding couple of years they were very average and, and as ben pointed out it was actually 2020 that had the lowest catch rate ever so while while it's easy to point to technology and say it that's a major factor uh I don't think the I don't think we have enough data to really make that determination. A lot of guys also point to and say, "Oh, it's it's now a young man's game." Well, this is the this the group that's qualified for the uh, 2024 Classic, including you, Ben. Congratulations, by the way. Um, is the youngest group that has qualified for a Classic since the 1970s. But is that an outlier again? Is is that number going to move back to? 40 got, years of age next year for you if you want it. So the average age is about 24 years old for the guys that qualified this year. So before 2020, they didn't do the um, angler of the year points for the all inclusive of the opens field. Um, so we don't have any data for 2018 or 2019. If we're going to say that's when forward facing sonar was, was out on the market, but in 2020, you know, if we're going to follow this narrative that we like to push and makes for an easy video title about how it all only young guys are, are able to get in the sport now. So in 2020, the average age of the top 10 guys in the Bassmaster Opens is 34.9. 2021, average age for the top 10 guys in the Bassmaster Angler of the Year for the Opens, 40.1 years old. 2020 U, 2022 was 34.6 years old. So there is no trend on younger guys making it. It is simply an outlier. Maybe it'll continue. Looking at the the, the class of guys that are in the Opens yeah. next year, it almost can't continue because there aren't that many guys under 25 in the field. Maybe it could continue and in five years when the average age is 23 to 25 years old. Then we can say that older anglers no longer compete. But – Looking at actual data, since live scope was was out in the opens, people that are qualifying for the elite series, there's no besides 2023. There's no statistical evidence that shows that. Yeah, that that data is very limited, and and it really skews toward 2023 as being the the one year where there's a real noticeable difference in all that. Uh, Izzy. At Killer Bee Marine, you install a lot of forward-facing sonar for folks. Uh, it can be expensive. So I'm guessing that your your clientele kind of may skew a little older, people who have more money. But uh, are, are is it is it a pretty wide swath of guys who are, who are picking up the forward-facing sonar? And uh, who, who learns it quicker? Some of the older guys who have more experience on the water or the younger guys who are maybe more tech-savvy? I think so. Yeah, that's that. So that's actually precisely what I was going to bring up. So Kent, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say some of that data um, being um, some of that data being 
more skewed towards um, uh, maybe older anglers that Ben was just mentioning. I think it has a lot to do with financial standings. I mean, it's they're not cheap systems. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. It's a big endeavor to say I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put you know uh, four to five thousand dollars on on the front of my boat, um, and and to um, and to you know, I mean, there's there's no maintenance involved, with it, but but to to basically you know in one shot say, hey, I, I you know, and then maybe pay. There's labor involved and stuff like that, obviously. So it just getting the system is thousands of dollars, and having someone install it is another you know, however many hour you know, thousand dollars or whatever it is. So um, I think there there is a there's a financial factor that has to be has to be um, considered because. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. When I was that age, I definitely didn't have that money to like, you know, it's I didn't have a, a you know money for 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 uh, luxuries of that, of that sort. But um, I would say who, the people who know it the best are the ones that, and this shouldn't shock anybody, are the ones that spend the most time and actually put the effort in it. I really don't think. I mean, I really don't think it's like it's it. No, I'm I'm being for real. I like my my mom. God bless her. She can't she can't use her iPhone, but she's, you know, she insists on like me showing her stuff on it, but she just refuses to learn it. And she's had it for like 10 years, but she, she refuses to learn it. And, and I think whoever, again, you know, it's not, it's, I think it's not complicated. Whoever just really wants to put the time in it, find the nuance. Like for instance, I fished the U S open this year. I, by day three, um, I tied Rick Klon, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I tell Izzy to out. say. <laughs> Not that he didn't weigh a fish, but that he no. tied Rick Klun. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, but um, but that's a whole that's a whole other show. But um, let's not get into that. But but I learned, you know, one thing that didn't hit me when I was fishing it was um, was how fish react to my boat when when I'm when I because I'm so focused on where they are and what they're doing and in the lure, right? You're so you're so fixated on am I throwing the right lure, the right size, the right color, in the right area. And then you don't even think about, you know, what impact your boat is having on, on the schools of fish that you're trying to fish. And one thing I talked to guys on after it was all done and I had done what I did, um, then they were saying like, yeah, if you were within like 40 feet and that thing hit them, it was it. Like they were gone and it didn't dawn on me. I was like, that's absolutely true because the school would be there and it wouldn't. So um, I think and that was that was a function of me just literally being a shop owner and a father and, 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 and everything under the sun. And I don't know, like a magician or whatever, whatever else I was doing, I just didn't have time to put into being on the water and actually learning that unit. And so it, it, it hurt me. And I only had like about a day of practice. So, 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 so if you were younger and didn't have a family, you'd have more time to learn it. Correct. And someone giving me a lot of money <laughs> and, and not having to work. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, and that, I'm and that happens busy. too. You know what I'm saying? But no, I, I think it's whoever wants to actually sit down. I mean, look, I mean, right. I mean, I don't know. Randy, what do you think? I don't want to leave you out of this. What do you think? I mean, I think, I think anybody, it's a tool. I just think it's a tool. I mean, it's, 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 it's like, it's just like anything else that is on your boat. I mean, it's just well, a little bit more complex. First of all, I got to call BS on some of Ben's comments here. Um, the reason I did that video is because, you know, he's been back macking on me for the past year on podcasts and some of his videos so that was the reason i did the video there I was what videos the the podcast that you did on mercer those podcasts using the uh using the thumbnails with tears in my eyes after i've never said i used the thumbnail two times i've never said, I've one, I've never said one on single video. word bad about you you're the one that started this okay you are. and i think you're gaslighting this whole situation because if all these outliers that you're pulling to, if you go back and you look at the tournament results, Bassmaster, any every level of MLF, BFLs, Toyota Series, Bass Pro Tours, how many tournament reports have you seen? It's, if it wasn't for my forward-facing sonar, I'd never won this tournament. I caught every fish looking at over every freaking tournament out there. Anything that's an exception to that is an outlier. So you can't use all these exceptions about somebody's throwing a chatterbait once in a while Go back and look. That's at how he tournament. qualified for the classic. That's the only significant tournament that he's qualified for, or in the elite series. Well, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you just said before. I said that's the only significant. He's he hasn't qualified for the elite series or for the classic, and that's the one tournament where JT qualified for the classic was on the bank throwing a chatterbait. It's just an example that I gave because it's very very short sighted and easy for someone on the outside 
that isn't actually competing or seeing how much work and time and knowledge this person puts in, uh, who, by the way, the only time he was on live this year was throwing a frog the entire day on the bank. Um, it, it's easy for someone to say that, that, that JT only made it because of live scope when that's an easy crutch. That's a really easy crutch for someone when they don't actually understand what's happening the way that they compete. I've never bad mouthed people for using the technology. I mean, they're doing what's legal. They're to put in a position. I understand you fish in the opens. You, you, you yourself or anybody else cannot compete without live scope. That's the reality of the situation. So I don't blame anybody for using it. I blame the tournament organizations for not regulating it more. But I don't I've never like, you know, trashed anybody for using that technology. You know, I got heated in the video I did on you over there for the obvious reasons why. But JT Tompkins is, is JT Thompson's is that Tompkins. You know, obviously he's an incredible angler. I'm not demeaning his accomplishment. What I'm saying is, you know, I fish DFLs, I fish Toyota series, I fish all levels of bass, you know, elite 50 series, everything out there. And like I said, all you have to do is go back and look at the tournament reports, the winners, the top 10, and it's it's right in your face every freaking tournament out there. And I, I don't see how anybody can deny that. I'm but here again, we're we're getting off on just one tangent. We're not, we're leaving out everything else that goes with it. Why do you think that range finders are illegal for professional golfers? They're allowed to use them in practice, but they're not allowed to use them in, in competition. There has got to be some type of a benchmark in our sport as far as we maintain that tradition. A lot of people don't understand that aesthetic point of view. I get it. I mean, it's, a lot of my supporters do. i got a ton of people that are on my side, but there's other people out there that, that they don't, it doesn't click with them. So I, we can't have this conversation unless you dig into the financial disparity that comes with it competition wise, the, the aesthetics, what it does to the tradition of the sport. Fishing traditionally has all has been about the unknown. Once you take the unknown out of fishing, I've harped on this in my videos, you diminish so much of what fishing is. And that gets into a gray area that people, when they're when they're trying to look at things from data and an intellectual point of view, which I don't think you can in fishing. I think it's it's more to it than that. And I understand that some people can't go there is the point here. Do you think that there that that wasn't created when you started fishing with paper graphs or 2D sonar? Well, there's you can't compare paper graph or 2D sonar with live imaging technology. I mean Well, it's it's not your natural wondering if fish are gonna bite or the the mysticism of, of, of hoping yeah. fish are gonna bite. Let, let me let me relate this way. It's like I Ben, I respect you as an angler. I mean, you're you're obviously a, a hell of a fisherman. I'm not saying you're not. But look at David. Let's look at you in 2023 and David Fritz in 1992. David Fritz was a master at that technology of 2D sonar, triangulation, all that type of stuff. Nobody else could touch him out there. You're a master at forward facing sonar. I I admit that. But look at the domination that that has versus what the 2D sonar had in 1991, which nobody else did. They had the technology, but but nobody was able to parlay it into success like he does. Now, everybody does, and on every single level. And it's not only the tournament anglers. It's these recreational dudes that are flaying the bass out. I talk to them all the time about it. crappie anglers. I got subscribers in Australia that tell me the Murray Cod population has been decimated because of it. There's a ton of other stuff we can discuss on this. Besides, okay. I'm willing to discuss that. So I actually took the time to reach out to the Missouri Department of Conservation to a gentleman that actually manages the the fisheries of Bull Shoals and Table Rock. I got a feeling you probably know those fisheries a little bit. And I spoke with the gentleman that's a fisheries biologist at the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And both gentlemen, when I asked straight up, I didn't tell them I was coming on a podcast. I didn't tell them that I wanted them to give me information that was skewed towards me wanting forward facing sonar to stay around. Because honestly, I don't give a shit. I don't care if it stays around. If it got banned, good. It's a level playing field. I'm going to keep using it. I am good at it. I do feel like I have expertise. <coughs> and like I told you before, I whooped a lot of ass before it was ever invented. But anyway, so I spoke with those gentlemen both of which scientists, head fisheries biologists, both of which concluded and quite simply told me that there was no statistical data since forward-facing sonar has been released, that there was any positive or negative impacts of 
forward facing sonar on the fisheries population, both the quantity and the size of fish. And that was both for bass and for crappie. The American uh, Sport Fishing Society did a study on channel catfish recently. They found the exact same thing, no positive and negative data. So if we want to dive into that a little bit further, Arkansas did a, a study over the last 33 years looking at data collected from beaver, bull shoals, Wachita, Hamilton, and Dardanelle, several different lakes. And they studied the tournament results. Um, they studied the average weight of fish weighed in. They studied the number of fish weighed in per angler, the pounds per day, the angler success rate, which is basically how many fish brought in per angler, and the angler hours to catch a fish over five pounds over the last 33 years. And what they found was the last five years since 2018 when forward facing sonar was released, or even the last couple of years when everyone is winning these tournaments and proficient with it, there is zero data that indicate a positive or negative impact since 2018. And there was a crappie study on the crappie population. I know people are, are like, yeah, well, we don't know about bass, but definitely it's going to hurt the crappie population. And I can see that because I can go out and clean out a damn lake it seems like i can i can catch my limit of crappie in 30 minutes uh, uh whatever 25 30 fish limited crappie here in texas if the fishing's good with forward facing sonar so arkansas went out they, they interviewed over a thousand anglers that came in with crappie from fisheries across the state and what they found was anglers with forward facing sonar caught 2.4 crappie per hour and without forward-facing sonar, they only caught 1.1 crappie per hour. So people with forward-facing sonar caught over twice as many. But anglers without forward-facing sonar, they brought in crappie not only that were slightly heavier, but they kept substantially more. They kept about 64% of their catch. Anglers with forward-facing sonar, on average, they found across the state, kept substantially less crappie, about 32%. And so really the difference, even though they caught over twice as many, was only about three fish per trip. And there was no statistical data, data, not comment section of videos where you, you, you talk to people and, and portray the exact same ideas to them every single day. But actual scientific data, there was no data that said that it was any negative or positive impact. And the reason that they they say that and they prefer for these fish to actually be harvested. When I spoke with the gentleman at the Arkansas Fishing Game, he told me that we actually don't keep nearly enough crappie as they need. About 65% of crappie die each year just from natural causes and from anglers. They hope to get rid of about 80% because they're replaced by the young of the year fry really, really quickly. This is something that I studied throughout college, different type of, uh, of ecological dynamics with different types of populations. And this is something that's 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 just scientifically it doesn't make sense to say that the, these things it doesn't and, and when when you talk to gentlemen that that actually manage fisheries and they say we need more spotted bass to be removed from these fisheries spotted bass are the number one biggest factor for largemouth and smallmouth bass fisheries being negatively impacted like table rock lake the lake that you like to bring up randy and, and talk about how you've seen these people at the boat ramp that said they use forward-facing sonar to go out and catch these spotted bass and they're filleting up limits. We need to be keeping about 20 times more spotted bass than we are right now to be able to maintain a positive impact on the entire ecological system. This is from fisheries biologists, scientists with scientific data, not opinions from people in comment sections from your own social bubble that the algorithm gets skewed towards when every single video you post with one simple idea and, and when you keep going with the same idea over and over in every video, and you think that the the opinions you're seeing from your viewers are truth, you know, really it creates a warped reality. It's something that they talk about. I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary Social Dilemma. They talk about it's the same thing with 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 uh, politics. I'm not going to bring politics into this, but if you see the same viewpoints over and over and over, and you feed into it, you're going to see the same people are going to reply with the same ideas as you over and over and over. So if you draw all of your conclusions from your comment section of your videos, that's a pretty silly way to look at uh, what the actual reality is. And there's no scientific data to back anything you're saying about forward-facing sonar being being removed, other than you don't like it and you think that it should be banned. I don't know how what those studies were like. I don't know if they were shocking surveys. I'll send them to you. 
Okay, I don't know the depth that they shocked the fish out. I've worked with the Missouri Department of Conservation before. I they didn't the shock them. There's no shocking. These are actual people catching fish and data observed. And 33 <laughs> years of data from tournament results. It, well, there's a couple of different things there. First of all, that is not what I'm hearing because I think I talk to just as many people as they do on the water, and I'm not hearing that from anglers in Missouri. I can tell you from my own perspective and the freaking – hundreds of friends I got the fish in the state that the fishing in Missouri sucks compared to what it was 10 or 15 years ago. And while those studies may indicate that right now, what are they going to look like 15 or 20 years from now when the technology advances further and just the, even the recreational angler gets more depth with it and there's more and more pressure. The, we don't have an infinite number of fish in these lakes. we got a finite number. And that's one of the things that I do not agree with the Missouri Department of Conservation is they try to put all of their emphasis on creel limits and that and that type of stuff, harvesting, and they ignore the important things like, you know, habitat restoration and, you know, let, you know, not jacking with lake levels. I, from my, I, I've talked to them, I've worked with them. I had a 40 acre lake of my own. I worked with them on that lake. I, I'm very familiar with them. And I'm just, to just, I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but I, disagree with a lot of their findings i have not seen it in my own personal reality like that what they're saying so, so again you're disagreeing with people with scientific data that it's their profession to study these fisheries because of people that you dude you know, i've been studying fish for 50 years I, you know that's so you know I, understand, more than they know. I understand where they're coming from but if we go out to table rock lake or stockton lake or bull shoals and if you compare the fishing the way it is in 2023 to what, what it was in, in 2000, there's no denying that reality from it. You can ask any of the Missouri hammers here that have been fishing as long as I have. They'll tell you, ask guys like Stacy King, guys that have been fishing in Table Rock Lake forever. They'll tell you the same thing. So I, if you ask I just um, that haven't adapted, adopted the technology and aren't good with it. If it's any good, they're not that, catching it. That is because, Ben, those catchable fish – are not there like they were before. All those fish are out where you're fishing for them, out behind behind the bank. That's, so that's why, they, why would they be out behind the bank? Because they've been the out there forever. An, but they're having an effect on it, on the, the amount of fish people are bringing in, but they're not up on the bank anymore. But at the same time, the, the catch rates haven't improved. They haven't declined. The amount of fish people catch per tournament, per day, the weights people catch per tournament, per day, haven't gone up. Haven't gone down. That is that is because you have a couple of different factors. You've got a, a much more keen, highly educated group of anglers from the top to the bottom. Not only electronic technology, but you got bait technology, rod and roll technology, trolling motor technology. And there's things that counter each other. You have that technology from one end to the other. And then you have the increased fishing pressure that's a variable. You have weather outliers. It's there's it's it's not just as simple as one as pointing the finger to one thing. And again, so how, is that, I don't, how is that different than any other time in history when new technology was come out? How is that different than when we went from 2D to side imaging or increased mapping, which we have, and then going from from that to th Hummingbird 360 and then going from that to live sonar? How because we are too good at catching fish. Yeah. And when you get too good at catching fish as a collective group out there, you're going to have some long-term problems with the fishery out there. They cannot sustain that. They might be able to for That's a little bit. That's not true. There's, there's data that says over the last five years, nothing has changed. Some of some fisheries have gotten better. Some have gotten a little bit worse. Some of most, almost all have stayed the same. There's no significant any, okay. any way we're looking at it. I, I I've seen watched that. for years, which is when this technology all has gotten to the cutting edge. There is no increase or decrease. It, there, no, I don't agree with that at all because – the it's only the thing data. it's it's the actual data. Okay, the data the data they're that they're getting is the same data that I'm getting. They're talking to dudes at the lake when they come off of the lake at the ramp. No, this I, this isn't talking to dudes. The, the the crappie was talking to dudes. That's I mean they're surveying people and seeing okay. the damn. Where they get the bass at? I'm talking about tournaments. Every tournament at six different lakes in Arkansas over 33 <clears throat> years. As far as is the catch rate you're talking. The amount of fish, hold on. Everything that was studied in those that survey was the average weight of each fish weighed, the number of fish per angler, the pounds per day total that the angler brought in, the 
angler success rate, which is how many fish the angler brought in, and the average yeah. hours to catch a fish over okay, five. Okay, you know why that is significantly different. No, here's why that is. Okay, if you if you go back to 1992, when you're giving when you're giving me some catch rates from 1992, you got to figure that those guys were using a bomber long a and a weighted rogue for their jerk baits out there and there were more fish in the lake than they are now because so they're catching them but now everybody you, you got a mega bass jerk bait you're not throwing your bomber long a there's not as many fish in the lake but you're still catching them because the bait technology creates this illusion that you are i i have zero doubt and i'm not saying this just to make myself to hear myself talk i have zero doubt that there is not the fish in our lakes population wise that there was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. We've just gotten better catching them. Let, let me pose you this. I, you, I don't, we don't watch each other's videos because you've never, probably never seen this, but back, you know, if you've seen anything, I've talked about the hellbender lure. No. Okay. You know what a hellbender is? Yeah. Okay. The hellbender was the deal in the seventies on Tabor Rock. You, there, you could go out almost any time of the year, except for like middle of winter and you catch big ones on it. I mean, 20 pound bags. If you, went out and threw a hellbender at Tabor Rock, I guarantee you wouldn't get a bite for a week on it now. But would, now, you, would you have, would you in 2019, you would be railing them still in 2019? The what? You would be catching them really good in 2019 prior to live scope, but you wouldn't catch them now? No, I'm saying that the amount of fish you've got, the, the reason they were biting a hellbender in 1973 is because there was 10 times, 20, 50 more times fish in the lake. No, and it's the, fish fish have not seen, the fish have not seen a hellbender in 30 years on the lake. So it's not like they're conditioned to not bite a hellbender. Why aren't they biting yes, a hellbender? They are. They're conditioned yeah, to uh, smarter by they, being caught over and over and over. And then, and then their populations, that the fish that survive over and over, they they know not to eat simplistic shit like that. Because yeah, they, let, let me jump in with a couple things, guys. Throwing uh, mega bass jerk bait. Is there a problem with throwing a mega bass jerk bait over a bomber long A, Randy? It catches a lot more fish. Okay, so why is that different than forward-facing sonar over 2D sonar? Because a, a mega bass jerk bait is not being able to look at a fish swimming in, within a live image and adjusting to how that fish moves with different bait presentations. That might have been true in 2019 at St. Clair when you're like, when Jason Christie says it was like hunting rabbits in a uh, Walmart parking lot when you're throwing smallmouth, but fish evolved. Fish constantly change and technology changes. It's part of it. Randy, you wouldn't have a job right now. You wouldn't be making money if technology didn't advance. You're not posting your videos on a damn 1992 <laughs> IBM computer. You're posting them on state-of-the-art technology. Like you can't speak out of one side of your mouth and means and then you're like, oh, fishing is is something that should be supernatural. We shouldn't use any technology for that. Okay. There's a there's a point of which where you have to draw some type of line. Now Ben, answer me this. What is wrong with the world of tournament fishing that you have a benchmark of 2D sonar and GPS, and that's what you have? It's the same with any other professional sport. They have equipment limitation benchmarks with the exception of fishing out there. And then let's get into the whole financial disparity that, that exists with it. That, that's one nobody talks about on the tournament realm. The financial discrimination and the financial elitism that goes along with that technology has a huge impact. I yeah, mean, that's, I, that's something I feel, that Mr. Duke has pointed out several times in the past that we cannot shoot ourselves in the foot again with banning more technology yeah. after we have already, not in the last five years, not in the last 10 years, 30, 40 years ago in, in this process over time, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, I don't. I come from nothing. My, my parents are school teachers. I literally, when I started fishing tournaments, I didn't know how I was going to get home, didn't know how I was going to pay for entry fees, nothing. I don't come from any money, dude. I'm just saying, like, we have created a tournament scene where people think that they need to buy this amount of boat money, this amount of, uh, of travel money, this amount of electronics money. We've created an elitist sport. For us to ban technology – or keep it from progressing at this point is a really slippery slope because yeah. that's why anglers like people like you and I can have the, these, these jobs, this profession of just a YouTube fisherman. You don't got to be able to be worth a shit at catching a fish to be able to make a living in this industry. That's why you and I can have this is because, you know, there's 95% of the people don't even know what tournament fishing is. They don't know what bass fishing tournaments is. And it's such a broad 
people, we like to say, you know, there's 80 million people that buy fishing licenses. So fishing is growing when in reality, you know, again, 95% of people, that's a vague number, but just from looking at everything that I've ever gathered over 10 years of doing this full time, they don't know what tournament fishing is. They don't give a shit about it. They just fish. We we've narrowed ourselves down prior to forward facing sonar prior to side imaging. We've narrowed ourselves down into such an elite sport that so few people can afford. And to, for you to say that forward facing sonar prices people out of it, I completely disagree with that. We're buying ninety hundred thousand dollar boats. You know, if, if forward facing sonar made it as easy as you made it to believe where you could just simply put a damn 12 inch Garmin unit on the front of your boat, go out in the middle of the lake and go catch them. That would actually be cheaper than if you had to actually do what, what you need to, which is have four or five units on your boat that are proficient with side imaging, down imaging, mapping. <clears throat> I wanted to get into it now. And it was as simple as you put forward facing sonar on the boat, then it would cost me $4,000 for electronics. But well, I can, I can say it costs can, you 25 to 50. I, think, yeah, I mean, I can yeah, say I, the same thing about a jerk bait. It's like, okay, mega bass jerk baits are great jerk baits, but if you don't know how to fish a jerk bait, you know, you just throw the thing out there and reel it in. You're not going to catch me any fish. It's the same with forward facing. Yeah, we're on the same page. But yeah, here, I, here's an example I'll use. I was at fishing the Bass Open at Lake Livingston three years ago. I've told this on one of my videos before. Practice day, second day practice, I pull my boat out of the ramp, and there's this dude in front of me. He's got a freaking brand new Ford F-250 diesel tricked out, iron cross deal, you know, jack lift kit, lights underneath it, brand new Ranger 521. I, I mean, $200,000 rig. Dude's in the tournament. He walks out. He's probably 20 years old. I mean, if that, he looks like he's barely out of high school. Then I go through the campground and I see this dude over there. He's in like a, a look like a beat up little mini Toyota pickup. And he had some challenger bass boat with like a 115 on it with like a little five inch unit the dude was in the tournament now you don't tell me that there's not some type of financial discrimination between those two dudes in how the did same they finish in the tournament huh how did they finish in the tournament i have i don't even know their names okay, I know that. that's one example one example that you came up with wow when i started fishing tournaments i had a 16 foot aluminum alumacraft boat with a 50 horsepower engine showed up to a local tournament. There was like 20 boats in the tournament and half the people had $65,000, which in 2006 was a lot of damn money, uh, sparkly bass boats. In the first tournament, I was like, oh shit, I don't got a chance. Well, when we went to weigh in, I fin I didn't know idea what I was doing. I finished like it towards the top of the pack, didn't win or anything, didn't get a check, but I was like, oh, okay. And after that, I realized that that's not the deal. Like, I just I don't see the financial discrimination you're talking about. No, I'm not personally going to go fish the Elite Series next year with a 16 foot aluminum boat with no graph on the front and whatever the hell came on my for for seven hundred dollars for that my dad bought the boat for on my my console. But at the same time, it's a level playing field, and that does that. Does, I think a lot of money has nothing to do with how you're going to finish in the tournament. I understand I think, it costs a lot for travel expenses. I understand. So, it's more expensive than ever. Are you, are you, so you're telling me if they go to the St. Lawrence River and you got a dude with a five inch 2D sonar unit versus some dude with three stack units up front, that the dude with the five inch unit, he's gonna he's gonna compete burning a three quarter ounce spinner bait over his shoulder against some guy out there live scoping him. There's there's no comparison. No, but are you gonna tell me that at any other sport that uh, a five six um, slow chubby white guy? Is going to go out and, and compete against the <laughs> Bond State. I think, I, I think if I could, sorry, if I could jump in really quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, uh, I think there's, there's a couple, there's a, I think there's a couple metaphors that I think about. I think about this a lot, and I think there's a couple metaphors that I think if there, okay, so if there was, if there was elitism in in the sport, some element of it, I don't think a ban, I don't think a ban would would remedy that. I don't think being um, being because uh, I think it's too arbitrary. I think there's no basis for it. I share. So the metaphor I wanted to bring up was the pitch clock in baseball. So this was something that was highly disputed for a long time because baseball purists said, look, this is the only sport in the world, not in the world, but this is the only sport that we have as Americans. That's like part of the big four, whatever, right. Or the big three uh, basketball, football, uh, baseball, maybe hockey, but 
but it's big three that doesn't have a clock. And they were very adverse to any device that kept time that dictated the game and they pushed against it. The issue was games were like, you know, nine hours, right? I could sit, uh, you know, in Anaheim on a Sunday and watch the angels lose for nine hours and then have like my whole afternoon shot. So they were right. They were like, the, the games are just too long and they instituted it. And it's, it, you know, it seems to have, have gone pretty well. So I think, while I share, I share sentiments in that. I'm not, I, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, you know, this is, this is, this is, um, you know, a, 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 a very demonstrable, uh, uh, easy, easy to put out and, and easy to see, uh, um, um, uh, you know, fact, and it should be implemented. I, I share the sentiments of what are we losing, right? Like, what are the intangibles? What are we kind of getting away from when we institute um, different, when changes like what are what are are we going to lose the essence of fishing you talked a little about that randy and i i share that sentiment it's just it's difficult for me to promote or be a proponent of a cause that that kind of um implements some um arbitrary and i want to i want to ask you randy you know uh what what a ban or regulation would look like if 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 there were one implemented in my mind i'm thinking there there are many ways in which we sorry go ahead ken it looks like you're trying to no i, I was going to i was going to piggyback on you izzy and, and and maybe randy you're the person to address this one are we going to get this genie back in the bottle i don't think so this is not the alabama rig back, backed by man's bait company this is humminbird lawrence garmin how do we get this genie back in the bottle uh or is there some middle ground uh, let me let me read you a uh, a text here I got from one of my subscribers that like points it out perfectly what I'm saying here. Okay, this this dude sent it last week. He goes, "I recent this sort of goes in, in line with needing some type of a regulation on it." Um, I recently got my Bassmaster membership re renewal notice. I've been a member since 1976. I'm I'm not going or, or I'm going to return the subscription renewal with no re renewal at this time. Include my note saying I'm sorry to inform you, but I've ended my 38 year membership because of your assistance support of live scope and tournaments. And furthermore, it makes watching Bassmaster television shows as exciting as watching grass grow. No more Bassmaster TV or membership for me. Sorry, not sorry. You know how many messages that I get like that. I mean, this is, there, there's a bigger movement against this. And I think that a lot of people realize, and that's just one aspect of it. Now, as far as a compromise, well, what uh -huh. is ben, ben, what's wrong with having, okay. If, if the electronic companies are subsidizing bass and they don't want to, you know, turn away a seven figure retainer from them, why can't they allow live scope to be used in practice? It's not allowed to be used in the tournaments. That way they can still sell product, yet it, it does create some level of excitement, increases viewership. People don't want to watch live scope. It, what's wrong with that? Is that a compromise? This is all your opinion. When you're saying Everything this, is our opinion. What? Everything's our opinion. You're giving no, your opinion. Your, your opinion is that people aren't excited by it. And you're sure. basing that off of people me sending a message to you that, you know, people, people that watch social media, that are part of social media, they want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of a, a, a tribe, a group or a tribal species. They're going to agree with you. People agree with me and they just, dis some disagree with me and that's part of it. But to say that one person sent you that and that they're going to cancel their membership, well, what if I say I had 126,000 people text me yesterday and say that they want to, to have more forward facing sonar be a part of Bass Live? You have a different demographic than I do. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. My demographic is 35 to 44, and then 45 to 54 is my second biggest audience. So I'm. I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if yours, yours probably skews older or whatever. It's not because I have 12 year olds watching my videos. I'm just saying like, you can't base factual knowledge. How about the fact that bass viewership increased the last several years? That, Is that just, but, okay, no, well, well, no, but I have speculation that, that say they don't like speculation that LiveScope did that. Do you think LiveScope increased the viewership 11%? What, I don't it, care what increased the viewership. It probably would have went up 20 say that people are, are Hey, this is proof. I had one guy texting me say that he's going to cancel his membership because he doesn't like it. Well, people don't like a lot of things. 
That's I, that's one example. I've got hundreds and hundreds of the same thing. Okay, that, well, I could say you, simply that I have thousands and thousands that like it. So that would be an increase in viewership, which means nothing. I have actually the, the actual data, whether I like it or you like it or don't, is that viewership has increased. Yeah, but that is not because of, of live scope. Do you really think it's live scope has what? increased the viewership? What has increased it? It, it no, just I don't believe there's, that. There's, I don't there's believe more that. people watching it. There's more tournaments. There's more interest in tournament fishing. Okay, but so I, I've lost count how many people said I do now. That less people are interested in it because of forward-facing sonar. It's not increasing because of forward-facing sonar. Everybody well, it's says not it's more. Decreasing. Okay, would you rather watch some dude flip a jig in a bush or a weenie worm out in the middle of Lake St. Clair for, for smallmouth? Just from a viewer perspective. You want to know my honest opinion? Yeah. I would love to watch someone breaking down some fish that we've never seen before in the middle of the lake with a live sonar image on the screen, catching those fish. And I'm not like, like I said, I personally don't give a shit. I will catch them either way. I'm just saying like, yes, I think that's more exciting than catching a three pounder out of the bush, uh, okay. catching a three pounder out in the open with the screen on the, I, I think bass needs to do a better job of live and they have, and they're working on it to get those HDMI cables working to the live screen to when, when there is a couple tournaments a year, when it's strictly a forward facing sonar type event, which again, whether you like it or not, it's a level playing field. Everyone in the event has the, the capabilities to own that technology. I'm not going to like Jacob Fouts has a 22 inch screen on the front of his boat. Let's not say that there's people on the elite series that can't afford to have forward facing sonar it's a it's a level playing field at that level. Like I'm okay with seeing people catch them that way. And some people might hate it because when they grew up, they were watching people catch them flipping bushes. But I mean, honestly, the majority of tournaments since I don't even know when, two since it was created, like you talk about David Fritz, was it a better viewing experience when David Fritz was throwing a deep crankbait on stumps offshore and catching fish? to a live viewer, which we didn't have then, was would have been looking at it like, wow, he's been throwing a crankbait and he's caught nothing all day. And then he's in the middle of the lake and he catches one on a stump on a deep crankbait. You think that's a better viewing experience than someone catching one offshore on a, what'd you call it, a wiggly worm? Well, Fritz was, Fritz, like I said, was an exception to the rule. So that created interest because he was the only one that could do it. Okay. But there, there was, but like in the two, when I came up in the two, 2000s and 2010s like everyone was catching them on like the ledge lakes and the pre-spawn lakes and the summer smallmouth stuff offshore on stuff that they found with side imaging um smallmouth on stuff they found with side imaging and then they were Im implementing 2d sonar so the viewership experience thing is interesting a lot of people don't like it but is that because they've been told that this is the wrong way to catch them and that we shouldn't like it and it's the outspoken minority like most things are on social media with negative topics or is it because it actually is a worse viewing experience because personally i would rather watch kyle welcher catch 27 pounds of smallmouth offshore than watching someone you know fish a ledge on a crankbait and not be able to see what they're throwing at 10 years ago, like Kevin Van Dam did over and over and over to win tournaments equally yeah. as cool and equally as successful. But I don't understand the viewership thing because they don't like it because it takes out the mystery. I'll, here's a prime example. My, one, my title sponsor, the guy that owns the company, he's, he's been a, he's got two Rangers. He's been fishing forever for 40 years. We fish together a lot and he can't stand live scope. I mean, he just absolutely hates it. One person. And, well, no, this, but this is, this is, this is a one person of many that has the same example, but we were fishing last year and we came up to this main, like a point we're talking about. He goes, I don't want to know what's on that point. I don't want to know if there's any fish on that point. I want to fish through it. And I want to find out for myself because that is what fishing is about. It's the unknown. And once you take away the unknown, which live scope does, it takes away the unknown from well, fishing. Did side imaging do that in 2D though? 2D sonar is not much different than, than uh, I mean, down imaging 2D sonar, there's not much difference. And no, 2D sonar is not live imaging the fish. It's not the same thing. You're not shooting a signal out in front of the boat and watching the fish swim and react to your lure. 
but the the point is is you haven't talked to any about this today do you not place any value in that wonderment and the and the unknown and the magic and the mystery of the, just the intrinsic part of fishing because I, I don't hear any of that you know you talk Absolutely. about it. Some, sometimes i go out and i'm on a body of water that's muddy and shallow and i throw a frog on the bank or i flip some timber and that's badass and then sometimes I go out and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm specifically trophy hunting on this clear winter body of water. Fish are suspending. And the best way to approach these fish is with live scope and forward facing sonar. And if you're someone that comments on a video or actually feels like seeing a 10 to 18 pound bass on forward facing sonar react and follow it to your bait and or eat your bait and you say that it's not exciting or interesting or doesn't teach you anything about fishing then i don't i can't even relate to you how can you like because i don't want to know that i want i want that mystery mystery to remain i remember again back in the 70s at Tabor Rock, there were old dudes trolling with 20 horse evan roos and their v bottom boats and catching nine pounders in the middle of the lake good for them i i don't i don't want to know what's out there i mean i i want to have that element of the known unknown i want them to have a safe haven out there where they're not jacked with and messed with that that is the difference on it. I put a different value on what fishing is, other than just catching. Once you start getting into the realm of live scope and AI technology, it becomes a commercial venture of catching. It's not fishing anymore. There's the element of fishing has gone with it because the fish that you guys are catching with that technology, you would not ever have known that they were there unless you've seen that. And that is one of the biggest reasons I have a problem with it. And I don't. I don't understand why we can have every other sport on this planet that has those safeguards within the tradition of the sport, except bass fishing. Did you ever read the press release they did on the uh, Alabama rig Bassmaster? They banned it because they said in keeping with the, the tradition that Bassmaster holds deer, one rod, one lure, we've decided to, you know, not allow this. It's, it's the same thing with this. Yeah, I, I read it and I think that, that's a great example of something that was uh, banned prior to any actual, like Ken said at the start of this, this, this podcast, it was banned prior to any actual evidence that it was a negative impact. And like I've talked about several times, very quickly, the fish evolved to not eat that. How many tournaments out at Table Rock can you go win now in January on an Alabama rig? How many tournaments anywhere can you go win any other time of the year on an Alabama rig? I agree. Yep. It was banned because there was no money in it. I mean, I think we're going to. Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, no, man, you know, guys that are partnered with electronic <laughs> companies. I've got buddies, several buddies that told me that they said they were ordered. We don't want to hear a bad word about forward facing sonar coming out of your guys' mouth. I mean, that is, it's about money ultimately on the tournament end of it. No, it's, not, it's about having the best electronics possible. And as, as you said right. yesterday on Dave Mercer's podcast, the exact same thing. And as the person that is the MC and does the live for bass and has electronic sponsors said he does not have any evidence or any op any people telling him not to tell you that it's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, I think we're going to get into when we start talking about what how much technology is too much. Right? I think we're going to get into the Amish debate. Right. It's like ask, the Amish. Ask the Amish debate, I, they, they were bound to make an appearance sometime tonight, Ken, but <laughs> but I think if you start getting it, it's so subjective. I mean, ask ask a Mennonite how much is too much technology, <laughs> and he'll tell you a tractor to go to Walmart and electricity in the barn. You ask an Amish person, and they'll tell you an axe and a horse. Like <laughs> Right? So it's just, you'll get such different perspectives, and they'll both look at each other and say, you're doing it the wrong way. So I think it's just once you start getting into this, the the once you start to get into this debate of well, this is too much. The same thing. The umbrella rig is is actually a great example. It was, it it was stated that it was too much or it was it crossed the line, but really, what it seemed to be, and and again, Ken spoke about this. Ben just spoke about this. It just seemed to be that this was the easy way out. It was kind of like, look, there's a lot of people upset about this. This is kind of changing things, and it was kind of a really easy call to say, well, just get rid of it. And I think there wasn't a ton of thought put in it because I think if they'd have waited a number of years and allowed other manufacturers to build that lure, then I think it would have been like anything else. It would have totally smoothed out. And I think, I think we're going to get there with, I think it looks bad right now with forward facing sonar because I'm not going to, you know, name names, but there are just some units that are just better than others. 
that's just a subjective fact. It, the same thing happened inside Image. There were some units that were just that we we know that were like way better. Now they're all kind of like it's just preference. They all pretty much work and look the same. It's just which one you prefer to look at. I think in about a couple years, they're, everybody's going to get their act together. They're all going to be pretty standardized, and I think I think. It, it, the prices will come down. They'll proliferate more. And I think this kind of won't even really be a discussion because it will be like, yeah, they, they all work the same. It's, I know for a fact there are, and we know this too, there, there are just some that work better than others. There's one in particular that works really well. And I think that's, there's, I don't want to name names, but there's one that we know that. I think and, we know who that is. Well, we don't have to, there's no, there's no need, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, what's that? Gar. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I yeah, think so so speaking of gars, good, great point, Izzy. Speaking of gars, to go back to uh, uh, you guys were talking about conservation and things a couple hours ago. Um, the one thing I wanted to make a point: I, I, I fished just recently in um, it, on Table Rock with a Table Rock guide, and and not that anybody really cares about uh, the spoonbill, but apparently the spoonbill are, are being devastated by the technology, so they're. There is some nuance to, and maybe it's a small nuance because again, it's spoonbill. Most of the world doesn't know what that is. But not they, talking about the old rebel jerkbait. Maybe, maybe. So I just wanted to bring that point in. Um, also, as far as, uh, and I saw the comment on the board a couple times about money. You know, nobody would be saying a thing about forward facing if the units cost a hundred bucks. Um, so it is, you know, one unit. Okay, you can get into it for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Izzy, how much does the average cost of putting forward facing on your boat? Depending on which unit you buy, size of the average screen, cost. Average, average cost, cost of a job. You're looking at you're looking at four to forty five. Okay, what's what's like the biggest one you've done? The biggest one we did um, was a. Oh gosh, <laughs> it was north of that. <laughs> I'll just say that it was north yeah, of say that. Say the number. Say the number. Uh, the unit alone was was was. How much was the whole job? About six and a half, seven. It's pretty close. That's to it. That. I mean, when they, okay, well, when the unit right. itself is when the unit itself is is close to four. I mean, the labor is not too crazy, right? It's it's you're you're going to get hit well, on the hardware. I mean, we're yeah, not, so, you know, we're not rebuilding an outboard. It's just, it, it, you know, we're just, we're just doing things a certain way, but you're, I mean, you're going to get smoked on the, on the hardware because it's expensive. So I, mean, so, I mean, like, you know, I, I have it on, on my little boat here. I like it. I think it's cool as hell to use. Um, and I, and I, at the same time, I get where Randy's coming from that it does disconnect you from what's going on. You know, I, I do see that point as well. You can kind of get caught up and staring at a screen all day. But my issue with with it, you know, potentially having an effect on uh, slanting the playing field, you know, recently uh, Pete from uh, Bass U, they just filmed with a Elite Series angler. It's a shallow water power fisherman that has realized he can't compete anymore without going all in on the technology. He's sponsored by Garmin and just put 50 G's out of his pocket over top of his sponsor money into the boat to get ready for the 2024 season. Oh, wow. That's a hell of a freaking commitment. And it's at that point that I don't like it anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I, I, I feel I, like I, banning it is, is ridiculous to me, but a limit of some sort, I think, is is more probably needed. I'll say this too, Brian, really quick. I, I think we be, we have to be very careful what we what we ban and restrict with regard because tournament fishing in a way it's it's almost like it's almost like think of racing like Honda in in the early late nineties and early thousands actually lost money on a lot of the motorcycles they produced, and that's because they put so much R and D into these things. In order to meet the homologation rules that like world superbike and moto gp or well not moto gp but world superbike particularly that, that they enforced that said look you have you 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 you're, you're you have to build this bike to a certain spec from the factory and then you cannot modify it beyond this point if you want to race it so they literally had to overbuild these things in order to race them and if we start restricting and putting in regulations i think we're kind of enclosing 
some of the, um, and I don't know, maybe that's the objective for some people that maybe they don't mind it, but, but, and I, I sympathize with that. I discuss that. I really do. I, I think there is an essence to fishing. There is a question of, um, you know, is there, I mean, I think this, this, this discussion, the AI came up earlier. This, this ties right into it. There's a lot of technology that's being made and I think we're doing it because we can do it. And a lot of people, I think it's fair to ask, like, wait a minute, like, why are, you know, I'm not saying this necessarily ties in. I know why we built, why we're building forward face sonar, but I think a lot of people are, 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 are saying like, Hey, why are we building this? Or like, what is it? What exactly is like a lot of the technology we design, we put it out, we design it. And then we say, Hey, look what we did. Like, look, you know, for instance, like facial recognition technology is one of them where it's like, we have this technology and we're doing certain things with it. And then there's certain people who are saying, wait a minute, there's all these you know, pitfalls and things and, 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 and externalities that we didn't count on that is that it's being, you know, it's being abused on some level. And, and I think when we created it, maybe we would, and AI is now the hot button, right? That's the big one right now. It's like, okay, AI is moving at such a rate. I was reading that even some of the programmers are like kind of scared of what it's doing <laughs> after they've, 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 they've made the newest renditions or the newest like versions of it. And they're like, wow, this thing is getting to a point where you know, so there is that, I, I feel, I have that sentiment. I feel that sentiment. I, I, I agree with the people that have it. Like, wait a minute, we need to stop and look at this. Yeah. Izzy, I got to break in for a second. In, in fairness to, to everyone watching, uh, Randy let us know that he might have to go at right about this time. So Randy, uh, if you need to go, let us know. We hope you can hang around, but uh, if you have to go, we certainly appreciate all the time you have given us. Yeah. I got to head out at 930 here. So uh, but yeah, I definitely appreciate you guys having me on for sure. Well, man, you're you're terrific. Um, you stated your positions so eloquently and 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 gave a lot of wonderful positions there. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, Randy Blockett, folks. And folks, check out Intuitive Angling with Randy Blockett on YouTube. Uh, some fantastic videos on there. Randy, look forward to seeing you down the road. Okay, I appreciate it. And I I really uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to you know debate with Ben on this. I mean, we went back and forth on it. I mean, uh, we disagree on it, but Again, good luck on the elites this year. I mean, I, I I wish you the best on that. I just, uh, you know, it's just one of those things, just agree to disagree, I guess. Well, absolutely. So, uh, Randy, you take care, and uh, we'll, we'll keep talking. Ben, I've got a question for you, um, because this has always intrigued me. Uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about is, is big bass, and in particular, world record bass. And I believe that if forward-facing sonar had been around, let's say, in the late 80s, early 90s, when California was continually knocking on the door of the world record largemouth, that we might have broken that world record, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 times in that time period. You're a master of the forward-facing stuff. Do you think that's a realistic analysis of it? Yeah. Do you think Japan would have done the same, though? Yeah. I think there's absolutely a chance Japan could have done it, too. Yeah, without uh, question. Um, I think the, I mean, everyone's talked about it. We, we've gone over this over and over, but the biggest thing, the biggest problem with California was um, whatever happened, I'm not going to go into politics again, but whatever happened um, with, with decreasing the trout stockings was the biggest factor in fish not getting bigger and bigger. So no question. Yeah, absolutely. And I would have loved to see what was, what was swimming around in there because I mean, I, I personally see it. I, I've stocked a thir high 13 and a, a low 14 in my backyard pond here, and I can't keep up with them to keep weight on them. Like the the the, the public fisheries that are getting fishing pressure that have people fishing on them, um, it, just not having those stockings is is absolutely huge. And I mean, we'd like to say that down here in Texas, we have these fisheries that potentially could put out a world record. But, I mean, we've seen a 17 now and some 16s the last five years, but nothing even close to a 22. Yeah, don't get me started on Sherlunker, Ben. Don't get me started on Sherlunker. Uh, me either. But, uh, but I, I think that's so fascinating. And I'm a guy who, who is not wildly conversant in forward facing. I don't have it on my boat. My boat sounds a lot like your first tournament boat. It's a 16 foot Alumacraft, but I've only got a 40 horse on it. There and it's go. got stick steering because I'm old and otherwise I might fall out. So uh, I got that, but, but I am fascinated with the forward facing. And at some point I am going to pull the trigger and get it. I'm going to spend less money than Brian's uh, pro friend who dropped $50,000 on it. But you know, uh, this is a, this is a debate Brian and I have had going on for uh, a week or so now. And that is, 
I don't really care how much a pro spends Boo. To stay out there yeah. and get on the water. I don't That's care what you care business. about. I don't care. I don't care how much a company spends to make a movie. I'm either going to buy a ticket or not buy a ticket uh, based on whether or not I think I'm going to like it. And the ticket's going to be the same price if it costs a billion dollars to make the movie or, or 200 million. So yeah, that doesn't yeah. bother me. It's a it's a bad way to look at things. It's a slighted <gasps> sour way to look at things. When we look at someone and we're like, Trey McKinney's 18 years old. He qualified for the Elite Series. It's because he's rich. It's because his parents give him money. It's because he buys waypoints. That's a really easy thing for someone on the outside looking in to say. When in reality, you don't know the truth behind that. Maybe some of it's true. Maybe all of it's true. Probably none of it's true, though, because of the entire nine tournament schedule that he truth's always in the middle yeah so the nine it, tournament series it, nine, the nine tournament open series is the great equalizer i love it i believe that bass instituted it thinking that a lot of their former anglers who had defected to the bass pro tour would be have a better chance of qualifying didn't really work out that way did it a lot of a lot of young guns showed up and and whooped on them pretty good and, and you're one of those guys, Ben, so so kudos to you. Now, obviously, forward facing is playing an important role in, in the world of tournament bass fishing these days. And, and, and I've talked about this with a couple of friends recently. I feel like uh, beginning in 1975, when, when D. Thomas won a BASS event, um, that kind of started the flipping era, where flipping and pitching became the most important tournament tactic in the sport. And I feel like that... That may have changed. I'm, I'm with you in the sense that forward-facing sonar is not everything. And anybody who thinks it's everything is, is making too big a statement. But I do think maybe it's become the most important tool or, or method about going out and catching these fish. And I think maybe the flipping era may have ended around 2020 or something. And now we're into the forward-facing sonar era. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to say that when you yeah but is it right i don't want easy i don't i don't know if it's right honestly i'll be just completely honest like i said i don't care if it continues or people if they ban it whatever but for me the most valuable tools on my boat 1a and 1b are side imaging and mapping and after that number two a clear cut number two is forward facing sonar i if I was going to Champlain or St. Clair or on Ontario, which I will be, then forward-facing sonar is king. But that's not everywhere. That's not the majority. That's isolated instances that were really put under the spotlight towards the end of the season at the time of year when only the bass fishing nuts that follow it very closely were really focusing on the sport because no one gives a shit about it. I, I understand. I'm a company owner. I see sales. I have, I've been making videos full time. I know when people watch videos or not. No one cares about bass fishing. It's especially professional bass fishing from about the end of July until February. And so when the to tournaments yeah. all hit it, at that time, it was like, what can we bicker about if we're super into professional bass fishing? And it becomes yeah. the viewers and the outspoken minority that says, these guys are only catching them because of forward-facing sonar uh, when they don't actually see what's going on behind the scenes. Because it's very easy to say, the rich guy can catch them, and if I had that amount of money, then I would be able to catch them too. Izzy, um, I want to bring you in here. When you sell, When you sell a customer a forward facing unit and you're, and you have to give them, if you can only give them one piece of advice in, in learning it, what would it be? Um, if I had to give them one piece of advice, I would say, <laughs> I would say, don't forget you have, you have other units on your boat too. <laughs> right. Because I think that sounds I like it ties into what Ben was just saying about the correct. side imaging a hundred percent. And I'm not, and I'm not doing that to big you off you, Ben. I think it's, it is true. I think if you, if you get too reliant on it and you get too um, it's almost like a curse. If you get too good at it like, and you become too um, um, it almost becomes a crush. You become too reliant. And um, you kind of forget that there's that there was another there was other ways you were locating and catching fish prior and 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 to just to just throw them out the window or to just say, well, these aren't valid anymore. 
um, I think it's short sighted, and I think it, it gets it gets addictive because again, it is um, it is a very useful tool. It's extremely um, I mean, it's hard to beat, right? Because you've got instant feedback you're you're seeing, but yeah. you could find yourself um, staring at it for extended periods of time and almost just kind of like you know sleigh riding around on your trolling motor just pointing this thing everywhere yeah. trying to get and then you could you could burn hours doing this and oh, yeah. then and then you could take a step back say wait a minute you know i should be you know the wind has picked up or or you know or it's now noon or something what am i doing i should have changed techniques or or let me look at the map I, oh i should be on this side of the body water whatever it is or, or i should reposition my boat so i think you can get kind of focused in i know it sounds like a non-answer because I, I just gave you feedback no no you know what would you teach them about the sonar unit yeah, don't yeah. use it <laughs> well you know but, I, I think i think a reasonable analogy to uh the forward facing stuff and that screen is is sight fishing for bedding fish you know where you can get locked in on that fish and yep. you're getting that instant feedback and it 100%. seems a lot more natural of course but uh ben i got a question for you when did you have your aha moment with forward facing when you said oh okay now I now I've I've made this quantum leap forward, and I feel like I, I grasp how I'm going to use this moving forward. The biggest moment for me was when I caught the biggest limit that's ever been recorded in history on it, sixty mm -hmm. pound limit in the winter at OHI. The second that, day, that'll do it, huh? <laughs> second day that I've ever fished the lake was when I had that moment. Um, so after then, I, I pretty much knew. I, I moved back. I, I was I was living in Nebraska then made the trip down there. I kind of stumbled on the lake by accident because no other lakes, power plant lakes were all closed. Nowhere else didn't have ice on it until we got down there. But um, yeah, really when we, when we figured that out and saw how you could attack these winter fish that were suspended um, with the technology, that was when I was like, okay, if I come to these trophy fish destinations, especially in the time of year when they would suspend, things can go down and you can catch the, uh, we caught the lake record, caught the 14th biggest bass that's ever been weighed in Texas history. The second day we were at the lake. Um, and since then we've caught great fish there. We've caught great fish all over the place, but nothing even close to that. So, I mean, that, that just shows you like how fast these fish can evolve, how little of an impact it can actually have when you start talking statistical data, um, when everyone else is using the same technology that you are. And, Okay, I'll be I'll be completely honest. I didn't get to touch on this when when Randy was on, and I feel bad for picking on him when he's not on. But to me, I see as someone that makes videos full time that it's not really a stance on it so much as I feel like it's a, a ploy to get easy views about a controversial topic. Um, I feel like it's sour grapes from someone that lacks success later in their career. I have. A lot of respect for someone that has the accolades that Randy has going to how many Bassmaster Classics and Forest Wood Cups. But I went and dug up some data just to show prior to forward facing sonar how Randy finished his career the last time he fished professionally. And from 2015 to 2019, Angler of the Year standings, he finished 74th, 128th, 60th, 102nd, 127th. And that was prior to any forward facing sonar having any impact on it. And so for me as a full-time content creator that sees people try to hop into social media spaces to get clicks and, and they start going by the uh, mainstream media sort of uh, method to just simply make a million videos about the most clickable topics. Like if you, for instance, did what I did today and searched Randy block it, walleye cheaters you'll find that since the walleye cheating thing which he's never posted a walleye fishing video or cares about anything besides bass fishing tournaments understandably he's posted 19 videos about the walleye cheaters that i found i don't feel like it's a genuine stance on it i wish i could have talked to somebody that was a actual pro at the top level that opposed forward facing sonar um and I think you guys did a great job of picking someone that was controversial to talk to or debate, whatever you want to say. Well, honestly, I and, like and I think really like a point of view that was uh, unbiased or didn't have any type of uh, other outside reasoning. 
Well, honestly, I, I think you'll back us up on this, Ben. We reached out to you and we reached out to Randy before the the back and forth on the yep. videos ever started. Definitely. So that was this was an episode that was in the works uh, weeks ago. And and, and BTC, I think it's we got to wrap this one up eventually. This has been our longest show so far. Izzy, Ben, uh, guys, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We're 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 a, a little a little tiny speck on on the beach of uh, the podcast world. And for you guys to spend so much time with us is a big deal for us. So thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Honor. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. And folks can catch up with Izzy Killer B Marine in San Pedro, California. Ben Milliken, of course. Milliken Fishing on YouTube. Fabulous content there. I always enjoy your stuff, Ben. Uh, I, I thought you might bring the whiteboard tonight. That's my only disappointment. <laughs> well, I couldn't even figure out how to talk without there being an echo. So we had to make yeah. minor adjustments <laughs> midway through. I, I'm so glad we got that figured out. Uh, so I, I'm so glad. But but no, guys, this was uh, this was spectacular. We had we had a great time with you guys, and I know BTC uh, will ha enjoyed it too. He, uh, he he. We've been so excited about and looking forward to this. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Yep, thanks, BTC. Thank you, guys. All right. What do you wow. think, BTC? That was, that was spirited. I was just having a spirited uh, conversation with the YouTube uh, crowd. Oh, cool. It was yeah. good. It was, it, was, it was really good. People were into it. Um, yeah, I think people don't realize how much you have going on. Nathan has a lot going on behind the scenes, but you're serving double duty out here, co-host, and trying to keep up with a lot of what's going out there on YouTube. So Yeah, uh, you, you you threw it to me early in the show, and I had no idea where we were at. I kind of was listening, but Izzy, Izzy gets deep sometimes, and it's, you got you to gotta listen to every word to know where he's at, and I was trying to – communicate with Ben and get some things fixed such no, with this volume. No worries. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so glad we got that fixed. That was, uh, that was worrying me up front, but yeah, we've been looking forward to this episode episode for a long, uh, a long time now, a few weeks ordinarily doesn't seem that long, but this time it was a big deal. And we hope that uh, we hope that the folks watching and listening enjoyed it uh, anywhere near as much as we did, because that was a good time. And and hey, before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Fish Insider. If you work <laughs> yes. in the fishing industry, uh, hope to work in the fishing industry, aspire to a career as a tournament pro, or just want to keep up to speed with what's going on out there, you need to check out Fish Insider at fishinsider.com. That's where you can sign up for Fish Insider News, the e-newsletter that covers all the bases in the business-to-business -business world of American sport fishing. You'll also be signing up to receive my twice-weekly columns. So... If you're a Fish Insider or want to be an insider, be sure to visit fishinsider.com and get in the loop. And of course, also BTC, we got we got mm. Fish Insider working with us. But you know, hey, we're we're always looking for a um, a uh, a bourbon sponsor, a Scotch sponsor. You know, and and, and I wanted to thank our beer sponsor tonight. It's a local brew. We're on them on them Kenwoods. The guys are in the Northeast, grab a Kenny. <laughs> for you. I like that. Yeah, that's that's a personal one for me. Um, yes. Well, I don't think we could have asked for anything more from our guests than we got tonight. That was, as you say, spirited. It was. I was. I tried to jump in several times, and it, I guess it really warmed my heart to see that you got ran over too when you tried to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, I, I felt good after that. I'm at least smart enough to know that nobody's tuning in to listen to me. Uh, they're listening to our guests. They're listening to you. And another thing they, they want to hear, I believe is, is a segment we got coming up here in, in just a bit. Oh, snap. Yes. The top 10 tonight's oh, top 10. And I know our shows run long, but I can't tell you how much I enjoy working on the top 10 with you and Nathan. Mm. That's such a good, it's a, Hey, talk about spirited conversations. Uh, Ooh. sometimes those conversations get tense yeah. when, when somebody is, is kind of, uh, when when I'm right, no, and no one listens. That's so sad. I hate when that happens. When it was it right. was like it was like my text messages were, were were like my words trying to jump in the conversation tonight. They just they weren't read. Nobody nobody could nobody could see them. 
<laughs> right? Well, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, because sometimes, uh, <laughs> sometimes Nathan will float a joke out there or Brian will float a joke out there. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, okay. You don't know quite to give it a thumbs up. You don't want to give it a thumbs down. Uh, you can't say ha ha. Yeah. So where are you? They need they need like that that face with no smile, you know, just a kind of flat. No, that's that that's 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 making a statement. Okay. So so yes, we've got our top ten list. What else we got? Uh, uh ha- well, we got upcoming ha- episode. Yeah. Oh, well, we got our happy birthday shout out to uh, our what? buddy Joel Vandercrawl. Joel Vandercrawl, one of my great friends. I mean, he's just a fabulous guy, a guy of many talents. If you're looking for anybody to take pictures for you, anybody to shoot video for you, there is nobody better. Uh, Joel Vandercrawl, a man of many, many talents. As a matter of fact, I had a text from Joel Vandercrawl a little earlier, and uh, he just said, this is a solid episode, Duke. He said it as though he was surprised that I was capable of a solid episode. So, Joel, come on, man. Yeah, well, I didn't get the text, and I gave him the birthday shout out. So we'll see. There you that, go. That doesn't get fixed. There you go. It's uh, you don't get no shout outs. No, he, Joel, you got to be nice. Got to be nice. Yeah. No, Joel is one of the best human beings anybody's Indeed. ever going to meet. So kudos to Joel. Exactly. Happy birthday, brother. Yeah. So without further ado, let's get that top ten rolling, shall we? I like it. I like it. Let's do it. Nathan, you ready? The top 10 classes every aspiring Bass Pro should take. Number 10, Bass Through the Centuries, an eyewitness report with Professor Rick Klung. Number 9, how to beat a polygraph with an MLF panel. Number 8, performance enhancing cookies with Professor Sherry Van Dam. Number 7, improving weigh-in results with a professional walleye tour panel. Number 6, say I do to a career in bass fishing. With Professor Trait Zeldin. Number five, Embrace the Healing Power of the Sun with Professor Jimmy Houston. Number four, Science and Technology with Professor Randy Blockett. Number three, Keeping Up with Rules Changes with an MLF panel again. Number two, Dress for Success with Professor Matt Robertson. And the number one class every aspiring bass pro should take, Sponsor Relations with Professor Jacob Fouts. Yeah, there big applause for the top 10. Another fantastic edition of the top 10, which we're also putting out through social media. And BTC, uh, during that, during our top 10, you shot me a little reminder, uh, a sad, sad, a couple of sad notices. Two former Elite Series guys, a couple of guys I really enjoyed when I was covering the tour, uh, passed away recently. Well, And, and one of them, you mentioned it, uh, Mark Tucker. Uh, yeah. Longtime Missouri pro, terrific guy. Uh, yeah. Apparently had a heck of a last day on earth. He uh, he went out and killed a big buck in the morning, uh, dragged it through the woods, came home, laid down to take a nap and didn't wake up. And, and oh. Mark Tucker was a joy to be around. He always had a smile on his face. He could get fired up about things, but uh, truly uh, one of the, the nice, nice guys, one of the yeah. genuine guys in the sport. Really enjoyed him. And also, I don't know if you heard about this, BTC, but uh, Dave Smith passed away as well. Um, Dave was a, a longtime elite guy. Uh, at, for a long time, he was the oldest guy on, on the elite tour. And uh, Dave didn't have a lot of great performances as an elite pro, but he was a, a favorite of the people who followed the trail and of his co anglers. He gave Did all he, his um, co anglers. Design, design the, the, the classic tro- or the, uh, the elite series trophies? Yeah, he did. And he did the heavyweight belts. Oh, and, and I believe his company also does the national championship crystal football and stuff like that. I mean, his trophy company is, is, is as big and as, as powerful as it gets in that world. And he I didn't, did I didn't know him yeah. and I never met him, but I heard a lot of really good things about him. From if, my you were, if you were a marshal with, with Dave Smith, you got a badge that said Dave Smith's marshal. That you would wear and you you got like a, a really nice leather briefcase and and he had like a like one of those oscars uh gift bags for you when you got in the boat it was amazing oh yeah yeah wow just a just a, another another really good guy so uh hurts to lose one guy uh from that tournament world but to lose two in the space of just a couple of days is is really harsh yeah that's indeed Ken? Yes, sir. 
next week next week's next week's show yeah what do we got um i think uh is it uh 15 ways bill dance was terrible for bass fishing is that what we're going with <laughs> The top top ten ways Bill Dance ruined fishing. Is that, <laughs> I forget what you came up with. I check my notes. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I I don't think we're going there. That's uh, that's yeah. Well, well, we're gonna be yeah. back in one week on December seventh, the day that shall live in infamy, not because of uh, an episode of Bass After Dark, but because of what happened in nineteen forty one. But looking forward to that show. Come on back, follow us on social media, and, and you'll get what our question will be next week. And and we assure you, we will have some more fabulous panelists for that one. Yes, I've I've got a I've got a whale of an idea that just hit me. So, oh, awesome, awesome! Let's roll out. Let's do it. <laughs>